Good evening. I want to welcome each of you to Hasty Baptist Church tonight. Isn't it nice to be in God's house? Especially when it's so nice outside. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I like the 70 degree weather. I like the sun shining. You know, do you feel a little better with the sun out? You do, don't you? Imagine how you feel when the sun comes back. Think about that. If we feel this good with the sun, imagine what it's going to be when Jesus, the Son of the Father, comes back for his children. Tonight, as we start the service, I um, have a few prayer requests. I want to lift up a few people in prayer. Um, if you will, continue to remember Officer Driggers. Um, he was the officer that was injured in the car chase last week. Please keep him lifted up in your prayers. I haven't heard any updates on him, but please keep him lifted up in his family. Also, if you will, remember Zelma Eldridge. Um, she is having chemotherapy due to cancer that she has, and she's requested that we keep her in prayer. So please keep her lifted up in your prayers. Also, if you will, remember Joe's daughter-in-law, Anna um, Gallimore. She's having some kidney issues and is going to have to have surgery. Am I correct on that, Joe? April 12th. Okay, let's definitely remember her. Keep her lifted up in your prayers. And also keep Joe's son, Keith, lifted up in your prayers. And let's remember Joe. Joe's having a procedure on Friday. Um, keep him lifted up in your prayers. Let's remember Jack Martin. I talked to Jack earlier today. Um, and then he sent me a message just a little while ago saying that he might get to come home on Friday or Saturday. Um, he is doing much better. He was struggling a little bit, but he is doing much better. Um, they've done um, dialysis on him several times. Um, they've gotten several liters off each time. So keep him lifted up in your prayers. Um, also, remember Heather Allison, her family, and her mother, Marie. Um, she had surgery today. I've been unable to talk to her this afternoon. So I don't know how that went or if she's even out yet. But remember Marie and remember um, Heather and her family. Also remember her dad, Gene. Um, he is still having issues from the bladder cancer uh, surgery when he had his bladder removed. Um, he is also going to have to have eye surgery this month due to the cancer. Um, keep them lifted up in your prayers. And that is all the prayer requests I have. Do we have any other? Joe. David Nunn. Remember David Nunn, um, prostate cancer friend of Joe's. Any others? Stephen? Let's remember Stephen is going for a physical on the 15th of March. Any others? If not, if you've got an unspoken request you'd like to make known by uplifted hand, please do so now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, I thank you for all you've done, Father, and for always, always being there, Father, no matter what. Lord, I just pray that your will be done in this place tonight. Lord, I pray that you touch the reading of your word, the singing of your praises. And Lord, that you'll touch each and every one of us, that we may hear that soft, still voice, that we will hear the Holy Spirit moving and speaking within us, Father. Lord, I pray that you touch each and every request that's been made known here tonight. Lord, the ones that have spoken out loud, the ones that are dealing with the different types of cancer, the ones that are dealing with COVID, the ones that are dealing with all the individual health issues they may have, Father. Lord, we also lift up the ones that aren't here tonight, Father. Lord, that you will touch them right where they are, that they'll feel your presence, feel your spirit tonight, Father. 
Lord, I just pray that you continue to move here at Hasty Baptist and that we will be the hands and feet of your son, Jesus. Lord, that you will stoke that fire within us, Father, that we will have an awakening and a great revival here in this community, Father. Lord, that we will go forth and we will share the gospel to all that will hear in both word and deed. Lord, just be with us, guide us, and direct us. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Brother Dole, let's worship. Many times in my childhood when we traveled so far by nightfall how weary I grow Father's arms would slip round me gently it say my child we're gone Going home, I'm going home. There's nothing to hold me to. Will I have a glimpse of that heavenly land? Praise God, I'm going. The twilight is fading, the day soon shall end. I get homesick the farther I roam. But my father has led me each step of the way, and now I'm going. Amen. How many of us are ready to go home? You know, we look at this. I'm sort of torn. I'm ready. My bags are packed. I'm prepared. But there's still some work to do here. Do you ever feel like that? There's some work to do. There's some folks that we need as I'd like to say, get a hold of. There's some folks that need to hear the gospel. I have family members, I have friends that need to hear about Jesus. And they need to know about Jesus before he comes back. Because after he comes back, it's too late for those that have already heard about him and haven't accepted him. Is that true, folks? So scripture says, I want you to see this. And it goes along with tonight's message, if you will. If you will, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 5. We'll be looking in Mark chapter 5 here in just a few minutes. But I want to tell you or share with you thought process over the last week or so. 
I was looking over some notes. I was looking over some different things and trying to look for a series or look for something on Wednesday nights and possibly tying Wednesdays and Sundays together and was prayerfully looking at some things. And I ran across something that I'd given Stephen uh, a couple weeks ago. We had had a, I can't remember if it was a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning, and we talked a little bit about Daniel and um, things along those lines. And Stephen came up to me after church and asked me, what supplication was and I told him I said see me the next service and I'll have some information for you and I can help you out there because it's different things depending on where it's mentioned and what it's about so I ran across some of the information I'd given Stephen and I started researching it and looking at it a little more and digging into some other scripture and one of the things that hit me is there's a lot of words in the Bible that we may not truly understand what they mean. Supplication is one of them. How many people use the word supplication on a regular basis? Anybody? We don't, do we? The reason's simple. If we use the word supplication in regular conversation, one, you're either trying to sound spiritual. Now, we don't ever do that, do we? Do we ever try to sound, I mean, think about it. Do church folks ever try to sound spiritual? We do. We shouldn't, but we do. One, if you use supplication in regular conversation, you're either trying to sound spiritual or you're from the 19th century when it was popular. Or the third and the most possible is you're talking about prayer. Prayer of supplication. And we're going to examine that a little bit and see what it is. To start with, I want to give you supplication is an old-fashioned word used for request. It simply means to request. And there's a little bit more, and we're going to talk about that here in a second. Most often it's used in old literature in this context of weary pilgrims or tortured prisoners. Now notice this. There's no surprise that the verb supplicate originates from England in the 14th and 15th centuries as an anglicized form of the Latin word supplicatus, which means, this is important, that's why I'm reading this, to kneel. The Latin form of the word supplication is supplicatus, and it means to kneel. Does that sound familiar when we start talking about prayer? It does, doesn't it? And we're going to examine this a little in Scripture. Its Middle English definition was to pray humbly, to entreat or petition humbly. How does the Word of God tell us to pray? We're called to humble ourselves. Is that correct? Over and over. And we're called to kneel before the Father. And let me share something else with you, too. According to Scripture... And I know there's a lot of discussion about this today. We're not to kneel before anybody else but the Father. Is that true? The Scripture tells us. And I want you to see this. A prayer of supplication is when we humbly go to the Father and petition Him and kneel before. Supplication is a request. And if the request is made to God, it becomes a prayer. Do you know when we talk to the Lord, whether we're just, hey, Jesus, how are you today? Is that okay to do? It is. You know that's prayer? That's prayer. Anytime we talk to the Lord, that's prayer. Prayer of supplication is when we go with a specific request. But see, supplications are not quick dinnertime prayers or bedtime prayers. They're not the little prayers, Lord, thank you for this food. Prayer of supplication is when we humble ourselves before a holy God and we lay ourselves on the altar, whether it's here at the church, whether it's at home in our prayer closet. It's when we put ourselves before God and we petition Him for a certain reason. It could be for several things. It could be for better health. It could be to solve an issue. It could be for a lost soul. But I want you to see this. How many times... Have we humbled ourselves before holy God and truly petitioned him 
for the lost. For someone that we know specifically that doesn't know Jesus. You know we're called to do that? And we'll look at some scripture. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look probably on Wednesdays and Sundays, Lord willing, at some different instances in scripture where we have the principle of prayer of supplication. There are several that we'll look at that uses the word supplication and prayer together. There will be several where it's the principle of humbly bowing before the Father, petitioning Him for an issue. And we're going to look at one tonight in Mark chapter 5. You see, as I said a minute ago, supplications aren't those quick dinnertime prayers or bedtime prayers. In supplication, the requester asks God for something from a place of humility and desperation. They have to humble themselves. And a lot of times, it's out of a desperate plea. Have you ever had a desperate plea for God? Have you ever had a situation where you couldn't fix it, only He could, and you had to beg for it? You had to petition Him? You know what I'm talking about? Folks, am I the only one that's ever done this? Think about this. I want you to see this. I want us to understand. You see... As I said, it comes from a place of humility and desperation, from acute awareness of inferiority and need. This prayer is not a groveling from self-loathing nor rubbing the genie lamp as if God was required to meet his wishes. This prayer is a humble prayer. Because a lot of times I believe in today's society even the church, and I was listening to a gentleman this afternoon and was talking about prosperity. A lot of times I think we treat God as a genie in a lamp. We go to him and we rub the lamp and we do what we're supposed to do and expect him to give us all these riches. You know, he doesn't promise us all these riches. He doesn't promise us material good. He promises to meet our needs in Matthew chapter 6. He promises to feed us and to clothe us, doesn't he? I want you to see this. You see, humility is crucial to answer prayers. A lot of times, I believe, we pray with not just an attitude of expectation, and we should. We should, we should pray expecting. Doesn't the, doesn't the Bible teach that? We should pray expecting. But I believe a lot of times we pray entitled. You see what I'm saying? Y'all know that word? How many of y'all know the word entitled? Entitlement. Most of us don't like it. I can tell by the looks on our faces. I don't like it. We're not entitled. Understand what I'm saying? We're privileged to be the children of God. Y'all understand that? Jesus loved us so much that he gave everything for us. And all that he asked in return is for you and I to give everything to him and to humble ourselves before a holy God. And to lay it all at his feet. And if we do that, he will meet our needs and he will take care of us. You see, I mentioned a minute ago, humility is critical to answered prayers. Every time Jesus encountered a humble, desperate person, what did he do? He met their needs. Is that true? It is. Every time in Scripture, in the Gospels, when Jesus come across, and we're going to look at this in just a second in Mark chapter 5, we see three different instances in Mark 5 where he ran across a desperate individual. Somebody, and two of them, three of them possibly, but two of them we know were very humbled. And they were seeking his help. And what did Jesus do? 
He helped them. He healed them. In Mark chapter 5, we see first, in the first few verses, where Jesus healed the man that was possessed by the legion of demons. The middle part of the chapter, we see where Jairus' daughter is sick. And he comes to Jesus and asks for help. And on the way, there's a woman with an issue of blood. It's been there for 12 years. She has been hemorrhaging for 12 years. The doctors, the soothsayers, everybody tried to do something. They couldn't do anything. They had done all these different things to her. They couldn't stop it. But just by the touch of his garment, she was healed. Because she humbled herself before a just and a mighty God. And we're going to look at that here in just a minute. None of these requests were too hard or too demanding for Jesus. He willingly met those requests with compassion, love, and power. When we humble ourselves before God, we acknowledge our sinful condition. And too often, I think we're prideful. Have you ever thought that, I don't need to give this to God. I can do this. I'm, I'm fine. I can, I can take care of this. Have you ever done that? That was your pastor saying, I've done it before. Most of us have. He wants us to give everything to him. That's what it means to humble ourselves before him. We're to give everything to the Lord. You see, I'd mentioned before over the next few weeks, we're going to look at some different scripture. I want to give you some, and if you want to write any of this down, you can. Um, if you want to look ahead to some of the things that we're going to be looking at, I want to give you some examples of supplication in the Bible. Some of the things that we're going to look at over the next few weeks, on Wednesdays and on Sundays possibly. Moses asked to see God's glory in Exodus 33. Y'all remember that? He wanted to see the glory of God. He humbled himself and he asked. Hannah humbled herself in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Y'all remember what, Anna, what Hannah asked for? Anybody know? A son. Remember she was bearing? She wanted a son. So she humbled herself before God. David in Psalms 83 asked for punishment of his enemies. And he humbled himself before God and received it. Hezekiah asked for God to prolong his life in 2 Kings chapter 20. Esther asked for deliverance of the Jews. Do y'all remember the story of Esther? Esther chapter 4, she asked for deliverance. And guess what happened? She humbled herself and the Lord delivered them. And the last one, and I don't know that we're going to look at them in these orders, but I wanted to give this out there for anybody that wanted to go forth and to read ahead is Jesus himself. Did Jesus ever humble himself before the Father? He did multiple times, didn't he? Y'all remember in the garden? But there's one time particular that I want to look at. Jesus asked for strength when he was on the cross and for power of the believers in John chapter 17. Do y'all remember that? I want to encourage you this week, next week, Go and look at some of those scriptures. And the pastor, I didn't write them down. I don't have them all. Praise God. We have video. There, you can go back and watch the service. And you can like it while you watch it. But I want to share this with you. Go back. Look at that. Look at the scripture. If you need me to, send me a text. Send me an email. I'll be happy to send you the scripture to look at. Um, because over the next few weeks, I believe that if we come... To God's house prepared. If we come prepared and willing, we're going to learn how to pray the prayer of supplication, how to humble ourselves before a holy God, and to seek Him for who He truly is. Today we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 5. If you will, go ahead and turn. We're going to start in verse 21, and we're going to look at Jairus' daughter where she has raised the life 
by Jesus where she had died. And they didn't know that at the beginning. But what had happened is right before this, I want you to go back and read chapter 5 this week. Read the first 20 verses. But in the first 20 verses, when Jesus and the others came to shore in the country of the guardians, there was a man that was possessed by a legion of demons. And he ran back and forth from the hills and the tombs. That's where he lived. Not many people could hold him down. They couldn't tame him. He had broke the chains and the fetters. They couldn't even chain him up. But when Jesus walked on the shore, the man came to worship. I want you to look at that in the first couple of verses there. The man came to worship. And then Jesus started a conversation. Well, the demons actually started it, but there was a conversation between the demon and Jesus. And y'all know the story. Jesus cast the demons out of the man. Cast them into the swine. And the swine went head first into the abyss. Y'all remember the story? They went out. And what happens is. The man stays with Jesus. Others knew who he was. And they came and they were amazed. The man wanted to continue with Jesus. But Jesus said go home. And tell everyone what the Lord has done for you. Isn't that what we to do? When God answers our prayers. We're to go and tell everybody what he's done. But a lot of times we bottle him up and don't give him the glory. Because when we tell others what he has done for me, when I tell others, the Lord healed my heart. I had a hole in my heart. I didn't have surgery like I was supposed to have. I didn't take heart medication like I was supposed to have. My grandmother, others prayed over me. Went to the doctor and they said, I don't know what happened. It's a miracle. There's no hole. I'd had it for 14 years. That's what God does. He receives the glory. You see, we're to tell others what he has done for us. So he told this man to go forth. In verse 19, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord had done for thee and had 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 compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in the capitalist how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Because of his testimony, because of his witness, all men did marvel. They started asking questions. They started looking at Jesus in a different light because they knew who this man was. Have you ever known somebody that was so lost? And we're all lost. Understand that. But there might have been a huge troublemaker. My dad, when he was younger, and he passed away February 9th. I wouldn't say this if he was sitting here today out of embarrassment to him, but he would probably tell most of us. When he died on February 9th, he would have told you that he was an alcoholic. He hadn't drunk alcohol in 30 years. Well, 28, 30 years. But he knew he couldn't go back. But the Lord saved him and pulled him out of that. He was much different then than he is now. Because the Lord saved his soul. And he would tell everybody. My dad would go through and he would tell folks, Hey, you go to church anywhere? You go to church? And that's what he did. he goes, go, You go to church anywhere? You need to come over to New Heights Baptist over on Highway 14. We got great preacher, we got great singers, and he'd tell them all about it. And what's interesting, when he was here, when he was in Thomasville, we'd go out to eat or in High Point. Hey, my son's a preacher, you need to go over to his church. He, he's got that guy over there that sings with good news. Uh, you need to go over there. Go, that's my dad. You know, that's what we need to do. We need to be sharing the gospel. Just like the man that was possessed. We need to share the gospel. If you will, look and... Go ahead, Stephen. Amen. That's what we're getting ready to look at. Look at verse 21. And when Jesus... And Stephen's right. Let's look at this. Look in verse 21. And when Jesus passed 
over again by the ship to the other side. Much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the ship. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Now notice this. Jairus is one of the rulers of the synagogue. He was one of the ones. Now, the synagogue, weren't they persecuting Jesus? Were they not going against Jesus? Now, there were some that were not. And there were some that come to know Jesus, some of the rulers. Y'all remember Nicodemus? There's another one, come to know Jesus. Jairus came, and what did he do? He fell at his feet. Y'all remember prayer of supplication? Y'all remember supplicatus, which means to kneel in Latin? He fell at his feet. Why did he fall at his feet? He besought him greatly in verse 23, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. He came desperate. Is that true? He humbled himself. He had great power because he was one of the leaders of the synagogue. But he fell at the feet of Jesus. He laid his power aside. He laid the things aside because he was desperate. He had a need. He needed it met. So he went to the great physician. He went to the master. And notice what he asked for. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Now why did he do that? Because he knew who Jesus was. He had heard because of the testimonies before. If you go back and you read chapters before, folks are being healed. When they're healed and they would go home just like the man that was possessed by the demons. What did they do? They told others. So the word spread about Jesus. Just like you and I, we're called to go forth and to tell others about what he's done for us. Now notice this, and Jesus went with him. Verse 24, and much people followed him and thronged him. They, when you're thronged, you're pressed up against one another. Have you ever been in the elevator before? It's the best example I can think of. Have you ever been in the elevator? I've been a couple times at the hospital before the virus and all, and especially high point over here. You get in the elevator, and all these people try to push into the elevator. I usually step off the elevator because I don't like crowds like that. Uh, a little claustrophobic. But that's what thronged is, is when they're pushed to cr against you and you can't move. And all these crowds were around Jesus and Jairus. Why? Because they wanted to see what he could do. They wanted to see what Jesus was going to do. Now notice this. And a certain woman, verse 25, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and nothing better, but rather grew worse. Now she gave everything she had to try to get healed. She had tried and suffered many things at the hands of many people. I call it being a guinea pig. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? My mother has been a guinea pig several times in different tests and trials for different types of things. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But I want you to see this. She had exhausted her means. She had tried everything she had. She had spent all she had to try to get better. And nothing helped. It just got worse. So what did she do? Look in verse 27. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind him. So why did she go to Jesus? Because she heard of him. She heard of him. Somebody testified. Somebody witnessed about Jesus. And when she heard about him, when she heard what he could do, she went to him. Just like you and I, if we're telling folks about Jesus, somebody else is going to go to him. So we need to be witnessing and testifying. Now notice this. When she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but the clothes, I shall be whole. Her faith. She believed in her heart if she touched the clothing. She didn't have to touch Jesus. If she could just touch his clothing, she would be whole. That she would be healed. That is faith of a mustard seed. I want you to see this. For she said, if I touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, 
the fountain of blood was dried up, and she felt it in her body that she was healed of that plague. She knew immediately the blood dried up. Isn't that what Scripture said? The fountain. What's a fountain? That's not a little trickle, is it? That's flowing. When you're talking about a fountain, that's flowing. It dried up. It stopped immediately. She knew that she had been healed. Her faith had made her whole. Verse 30. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? Now notice what happened here. Jesus was surrounded by all these folks. And they were up against him body to body. He realized that the power had left his body and healed someone. Jesus knows all things, doesn't he? He does. He knew. And he turned around. And what did he do? Who? Who touched me? Now, if you were one of his disciples walking with him, and you're pressed into one another, and you're in that type of crowd, would you think that's a crazy question? Yeah. What do you mean, who touched you? Everybody's touching everybody. We're on top of one another. Let's look at Scripture and see what's said here. And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. I want to show you this, why these verses are there. It's to show us that we look at the physical, not the spiritual. The disciples are like, well, everybody's touching you. He wasn't asking who physically touched him. Because did she physically touch Jesus? No, she touched the clothes. The hem of his garment, so to speak. I want you to see this. She touched him with her faith. With her fervent prayer. With a prayer of supplication. With her humility. She touched him. And she was healed because of that. Now notice this. He looked around to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Now go back to prayer of supplication. To kneel before, to humbly bow. What did she do? She knew that she was healed. So she went and told him exactly what she did. But she didn't go face to face, did she? She fell down and worshipped at his feet. She gave him honor and respect. She worshipped Jesus. Notice this. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Because of her faith, she was healed. Not just physically but spiritually. Notice the two aspects in those verses we just read about physical and spiritual. Now, I want you to see this. As all this was going on, where were they going? Y'all remember? To Jairus' house. Why? Because his daughter was sick. Now, when Jairus had left and went to get Jesus, all he knew was she was sick and she needed to be healed. But notice what happens in the next few verses. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Notice the message that he got. Not that she's gotten worse. Not that the illness has progressed. But thy daughter is dead. Don't trouble the master anymore. And you know, I think sometimes that's how we look at it. We look at we're troubling Jesus when we give him our all. When we give him those little problems, when we give him everything. Sometimes I think we think we're troubling him. You know we're not troubling Jesus. When you ask Jesus something or go to Jesus about something, it doesn't how, matter how small or how big. It's not a trouble to him. And he will see us through. Now notice what happens here. Verse 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Notice what he said. 
Be not afraid. Don't fear because of what they said. Only believe. Because when Jairus came to Jesus, he came in great faith, didn't he? He put his livelihood on the line. Y'all understand how bad it would have been then for a leader of the synagogue going to Jesus who they were persecuting for help? Do we ever look at that in this story? I want you to think about that. He said, don't be afraid. Notice what he said. Just believe. Believe the same way that you did a while ago. Just because they told you that she has died, don't be afraid. Only believe. Look in verse 37. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John and the brother of James. Now notice this. He wouldn't allow the others to go in. Only Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he come unto the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult, and they that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make thee ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Why are you having all this drama? Go on. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. Now notice what happens here. And they laughed him to scorn. What does that mean? They laughed at him. They made fun of him. They mocked him. But when he had put them all out, notice what he did. They didn't believe. They didn't believe. That's just like when we pray over someone and we Call folks to come down and put their hands on folks, lay hands on folks. And that's a real thing that we do. And when we do that, if you don't believe that they can be healed, you need to stay in your seat. Understand what I'm saying? Because it's the faith. So what did Jesus do? He set them out the house. He made them leave. He ran them out. Notice what happens. He said... But when he had put the amount, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel. We already know the father believed, don't we? And we know that the mother, what mother doesn't want their child to live? Think about this. Now look at this. And, they, and them that were with him, which were the three disciples, and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took that damsel by the hand and said to her, Talitur cumi which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto you, unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked. For she was the age of twelve years old, and they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Now I want you to see this. Jesus went into the room and he took the mother and the father and he took the three disciples with him. The ones that he knew believed. And they went in and he raised her from the dead. He healed her. Then he gave her bread. Why did he give her bread? Hungry. To sustain her. To give her strength. Jesus is the bread of life. Y'all see that? And this is not the first or the only time that it's mentioned in Scripture where he gives bread and it's not only physical, it's spiritual. I want you to see this. There's more to the living Word of God than physical. It's spiritual. He is the bread of life. And because of faith, because of a prayer of supplication, do you believe that Jairus had been praying for his daughter? I do. I believe that he came in prayer to Jesus. He humbled himself. He threw himself at his feet. And then, not only that, Jesus took a detour. Is that true? Remember the woman with the issue of blood? She came and stopped the procession. They were on their way to heal the daughter. But she stopped the possession and Jesus took care of it. It's a reminder to you and I when we are in a need and we're in the midst of it and it seems like that Jesus isn't going to ever meet our need. 
It's not our time, it's his time. And if we have faith and we seek him in a prayerful supplication, a prayer supplication, he will meet our needs. Let us pray. Your great step. Must have been. Let's pray, Stephen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, as we humble ourselves in your presence, Father, Lord, I pray that you touch our hearts and, Lord, that we see your hand in all that's around us, Father. And, Lord, that we truly seek you in a prayer of supplication, that we truly put you first and give our all to you, Father. Tonight, there may be someone here. There may be someone watching online. There may be someone that needs to know that you care. And we know that you care, but sometimes we keep our eyes on the physical instead of looking at the spiritual. And Lord, I just want to intercede tonight. And Lord, I want to come to you and pray that your will be done in this place, in your body, in your bride. Lord, that we will be the hands and feet of Jesus to all that we meet. And Lord, that we will pray the prayer of supplication for the lost within our lives, for the ones that we know, and for the ones that are sick, that we will intercede for that we will continue to pray for and lift up. And I already know there's several that several of us here are praying in one accord for on a daily basis. And Lord, I pray that your will be done in their lives and that you heal them from the inside out. Lord, I pray that you heal our land from the inside out, that we will be the hands and feet of Jesus that shares the gospel. Because I believe that there's a great awakening coming. I believe there's a great revival if Your people will unite together and strive to do your will. Lord, just be with us. Guide us and direct us. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen.